Congrats! You've now written down the Hartree-Fock energy for helium atom in terms of one and two electron integrals. Now, somebody, hopefully a computer, has to then go grind out what these integrals really are, but symbolically, that's it. So this is a piece of cake to write these kind of things down. Um, yeah. Now, is this as far as we can simplify it before we hand it off to uh, somebody who's good at calculus or a computer? Well, possibly we can do a little more work on this. So let's think about this a bit. Turns out this last term winds up being zero. Um, is there any obvious reason for this? Well, I better come back to my integral notation to see exactly what does that integral look like and uh, how do I make sense of that? This gets us into a topic called spin factorization. So although it's nice to do derivations in terms of spin orbitals, ultimately we want to come back and connect to spatial orbitals. So let me talk you through that for a few slides. Uh, it'll take a little bit to explain, but it's ultimately sort of trivial. So my spin orbital chi, I said it's a function of x. What was x? x, y, and z in a sort of a fakey spin coordinate omega. Um, typically, um, we'll write a spin orbital as a spatial part, uh, 5r, that depends on the spatial coordinates, x, y, z, and a spin part, which uh, we'll call sigma, okay? And formally, I'm going to write sigma as a function of omega. Really, I could just write an alpha or a beta ket, but uh, I'm kind of following along the way Zabo and Oslin do it, because uh, I think it's maybe a little easier to learn pedagogically. Okay. So in other words, chi of x is really 5r times uh, sigma of omega, where sigma is some spin function that we'll talk about in a second. Now, my operators in Hartree-Fock theory, h and 1 over r12, they don't really care what the spin is, you know? Um, so that's relevant. Uh, and what that means is that when I have these integrals over x, really I can factorize that integral and make it an integral over a spatial part times an integral over a spin part. So I'm going to pull the integra integration over the spin part omega out because there's no operators that take derivatives or anything. I'm going to just pull that out and do it as a separate factor and then multiply it by the spatial part. So in other words, Starting from this definition for the one electron integral, here I'll be general and use i and j, but really for Hartree-Fock, I just need i with i. Um, so I got this equation. And if I then insert from my spin orbital, like we pretty much always do in quantum chemistry, uh, a spatial part uh, phi times the spin part sigma. So this chi i went to phi i times sigma i, and it had a star, so I still need stars. Then this chi j went to phi j times sigma j. Um, great. And then you see that the sigma i of omega times sigma j of omega has nothing to do with the rest of it, so I can factorize that part of the integral out. And then you get an integral over omega, phi i star of omega phi j, so, sorry, sigma i star of omega times sigma j of omega times the integral over space. Okay? And what I'm going to argue is that this spin factor uh, this uh, spin integral that multiplies this spatial integral has a simple form. It winds up being only zeros or ones. And so that's going to be a piece of cake to deal with. And again, in terms of having notation that is convenient and easier, I'm going to find it convenient if I have a spatial orbital integral specifically, uh, then instead of this bracket notation, I'm going to use these uh, rounded uh, parentheses um, to mean almost the same thing, but with the parenthesis I'm going to imply that it's specifically a spatial orbital integral over spatial orbitals phi with only spatial coordinates are relevant. So this guy is kind of like a, a, a twin to this guy, but it means the spin part's already been taken care of by somebody else and just do the spatial part. And what is the spin part? Well, it's this part, which we're about to take care of. Um, yeah, so that part is that part. Um, and before I uh, talk about how to do that integral over the spin coordinates, let me do a similar thing to the general two-electron integral. 
So here's the decoder for this again, electron one on the left, electron two on the right, stars on positions one and three, no stars on positions two and four. So that's that. And now suppose I do the same thing, where these chi's are really a product of a spatial part phi times a spin part sigma. So it'll break down this way. An x turns into an r times an omega, same thing for this x. Um, chi i star turns into phi i star uh, of r times sigma uh, i star of omega. Okay, so that's just chi i star being decoded into this product. Chi j decodes into this product. There's no star on him, so there's no star on those guys. Uh, and then chi uh, k star of x2 turns into a product of a spatial part and spin part with k's on them. And then L turns into a spatial part times a spin part. So although this is kind of a long expression, what I did was very, very simple. I just wrote a chi in terms of phi times a sigma. Then I do the same trick I did in the last slide. I pull all the sigma integral stuff out to the left because it's unaffected by anything else that's going on. So it really is a product of, and in fact, electron one, um, its integration has nothing to do with the integration for the spin for electron two. So I can pull out integration over electron one separately, uh, multiply it by the integration for spin for electron two. Now here, electron one and two are coupled. Why? Because I've got one over R12. So that means this last piece is not a product of a integral over R1 times an integral over R2. They, they couple with each other uh, here. So it's sort of a truly uh, double integral. Uh, but this is just an integral over one coordinate, and that's an integral over one coordinate. And again, I'm going to argue that this integral is uh, simple. It's going to be 0 or 1, and this integral is going to be simple, so it's going to be 0 or 1. So those are going to eventually go away or factor out, and I'll be left with this last piece, which is my two-electron integral, but now I specifically am dealing with spatial orbitals, phi, and I'll give it a symbol, and guess what? I'll use kind of a princess notation again, okay? So this symbol, princess ijkl, is this two-electron integral, but now I know it's with spatial functions and spatial coordinates, and I'll do the spin stuff separately. Okay, so how do I do these spin integrals? Well, it turns out it's the easiest thing in the world. Um, sigma is, unless you're doing something elaborate and unusual, it's just an alpha spin function or a beta spin function. And these have very simple rules. They evaluate to zero or one. And here they are. Alpha times an alpha uh, gives me one. Beta times a beta gives me one. Any mixed one, alpha with beta, gives me zero. And uh, like normally in quantum mechanics, you'll have one thing with a star on it and another thing that doesn't have a star on it. So, you know, we'll have that. Uh, but otherwise, that's it. So, great. So all those things that are there on paper, they wind up just going away. And if it's zero, that's really great because a zero times the spatial integral is zero because zero times anything is zero. So uh, zero, we love that one because it means we don't even have to do the spatial integral. If you get a one, then it means, well, the spin part went away and now I go do the spatial orbital integral. Okay, so let's walk through this. I'll show all the pieces, but I'll walk through it a little quickly because it's uh, once you see what's happening, it's not complicated. Uh, so if I had this generalized guy, um, Brockett notation, IHJ, then it's the spatial integral, parenthesis IHJ, times the spin factor. And what is the spin factor? Well, it's either one or zero. If the spin of spin orbital I is the same as the spin of spin orbital J, so if they have the same spin, they're both alpha or both beta, say, then I get a one for this first part, and then it's just the spatial orbital integral. If these guys have different spins, then the spin orbital goes to zero, and zero times this thing is still zero. So those are your two choices. And remember, in Hartree-Fock, I don't have these off-diagonal ones, I, H, J, I just have diagonal ones, so that's going to make it easy uh, to evaluate. I'll show you that in a second. So the one electron integral survive if the spin orbitals have the same spin, both alpha or both beta. 
what about the two electron integrals? Well, I had these two spin factors. Electron one gave me sigma i star times sigma j, and electron two gave me sigma k star times sigma l, and then I had the spatial orbital integral. Um, what needs to happen? Well, sigma i needs to be the same spin as sigma j, and sigma k needs to be the same spin as sigma, uh, as sigma l. Otherwise, one or the other of these factors will go to zero, and then the whole thing goes to zero, because they're all multiplied by each other. So, great. Um, I either have zero or a surviving spatial orbital integral if um, sigma i equals sigma j and sigma k equals sigma l. Now, uh, sigma i and j, those are the first two indices, so you could look at the first two indices in my spin orbital integrals there. They both alpha or both beta. Great. And then you look at the third and fourth ones, that's k and l, say are they the same spin or not. And if uh, either of those is not the same spin, then you write a zero and you keep rolling. Okay, so i and j need to match and k and l need to match. Or the left ones need to match and the right ones need to match, however you want to think about it. Okay, now the previous couple slides were talking generically, but in Hartree Fock, I don't have generic one electron and two electron integrals. I have specialized ones. The one electron integrals have the same index, i with i. The two electron integrals are either i, i, j, j, or i, j, j, i. So, if I have these specific cases that I'm doing Hartree Fock, how do those spin integrate? Well, i with i is easy because um, whatever the spin of chi i is, it's the same as itself. And so I'll get a one for the spin factor and I'm just left with this guy. So that guy always, I with I always survives spin integration and just turns into a spatial orbital integral and I've already done the spin part. Great, so this is convenient. Just work with the spatial integrals, uh, the phi's and you're good. Because remembering alpha with alpha or beta with beta is one and it's one or the other of these cases because it's diagonal. How about these uh, Coulomb integrals? Well, in the Coulomb case, uh, whatever the spin of chi i is, it's the same as itself, and likewise with j. So if I factor this out, I get sigma i times sigma i, because they both came from the same spin orbital chi i, and then sigma j with sigma j, because they both came from the same spin orbital. And so this guy always survives, because it's either alpha or beta, but it's the same as itself, likewise this one, and so I'm just left with the spatial orbital integral. So that's a one, that's a one, and it's just this thing. So this is a piece of cake so far. It's almost like, why did I bother to tell you about spin? Because it always just turns into one, so who cares? Well, except for this guy. Okay, this is why I'm telling you about it. This guy, well, sometimes yes, sometimes no. So let's do the same thing. Chi i turns into sigma i times phi i chi j turns into sigma j times phi j, et cetera, et cetera. So I get this thing, um, and this last part's just the uh, parenthesis, i, j, j, i, so that's easy. This first thing, does this survive sigma i, sigma j? Well, it depends. Is it the same spin or not? Uh, who knows? These are different spin orbitals. They might be the same, they might be different. Same thing here, um, sigma j, sigma i, it's the same pair, but in reverse. So I need to know, do i and j have the same spin part? Um, and they might, or they might not. It just depends on what they are. So sometimes this integral survives and gives me the spatial orbital integral times ones if they have the same spin part. If they have opposite spin parts, then the spin integrals will go to zero, and so then I just get a big zero. So it's kind of easy uh, bracket ijji equals parenthesis ijji uh, if the spin integration goes to one, otherwise it equals zero. So now let's go back and do another example. I started all this by saying, does helium, uh, can it be simplified? So now we're back to this. So remember we had our spin orbitals i, uh, um, i and j, or I numbered them one and two. Now I'm going to number them a little bit different way. I'm again following the notation on Zabel and Oslin. Instead of calling them one and two, I'm going to call them one and one bar. Why am I going to do that? Well, because they're in the same spatial 
orbital. So I'm going to kind of account for that and say, you know what, they're both in a 1s orbital. And the only difference is one's alpha and one's beta. So the beta one will get a little overbar on it to remind me it's beta spin. Otherwise, it'll be alpha spin. How is that spin integrate? Well, uh, again, it's a sum over the electrons. There's only two electrons. So we get a one electron term, 1h1. And then this beta spin guy will give me one bar, h1 bar. Uh, and then this guy, there's only one unique pair. It's the one one bar pair. And if I, um, well, you can order them however way you do, uh, however you, way you want. Um, let's, for this slide, assume one is numbered first and then one bar comes next. So then if I have, I has to be greater than J, then it's one bar, one bar, one, one. And then this guy uh, is then one bar, one, one, one bar, that guy. And it's got a minus sign on it, so don't forget that. Now let's integrate this with respect to spin. The one electron integrals I just argued always survive spin integration and just turn into spatial orbital integrals. So that's trivial. Um, but this guy goes away. Why? Because I've said for a two electron integral to survive spin integration, indices one and two have to have the same spin. And this guy does not. Similarly, indices three and four need to have the same spin. And this guy also does not satisfy that either. So for a couple reasons, it's zero. How about this one? Do indices one and two have the same spin? Yeah, they're both beta, so that survives. How about three and four? They're both alpha, so that survives. Or if you like left, right, the ones on the left are the same, the ones on the right are the same, it survives. But here they weren't. So um, that guy just goes away and you don't worry about it. So it's this. And then I could use my parenthesis notation to say, okay, now I've already taken care of all the spin stuff. It all turned into ones and zeros. And what's left is uh, this guy, uh, parenthesis 1h1. Uh, this guy, uh, parenthesis 1 bar h1 bar. And then parenthesis 1 bar 1 bar 1 1. Okay. And that could still be further simplified a little if I um, use one more trick. But that's how far we've gotten so far. Let's talk about that. Normally, I can take this one more step. How do I do that? Well, thinking about helium again, let's think about the spin orbital. Spin orbital one was just um, 1s alpha. So um, I had a 1s orbital with an alpha spin. And then uh, chi one bar was 1s beta, which again was in a 1s orbital with a beta spin. But notice that um, my spatial part is the same. That's the way an average chemist would normally think about it, and they, they would be right to do so. Why not? There is, it's the same spatial orbital. So um, the fact that that spatial orbital is exactly the same, does that give me a simplification? And if I wanted just for numbering purposes for this example, I could just call it orbital number one, 1s or 1, whatever you want to call it. It doesn't matter. Uh, it's a spatial orbital, though, phi. Well, noticing that the spatial part is the same, then by the time the spin part all went to one or zero, that spatial part's the only part I have left to do the integral on. And so those spatial integrals ought to be the same if I'm talking about alpha electron or beta electron. So let's go back and look at that expression again and see, can I make it a little simpler? Well, um, so I had this from the previous slide. And now let me go back to this Braquette notation with the spin orbital, 1h1. Well, here's your chi's. And then uh, in spin orbital number one, that was the alpha spin, so that alpha spin. So here comes the alpha that I factored out, and then there's the spatial part. The spatial part I just write as this, parenthesis 1h1, and this guy goes to one. What about the beta spin one? Um, well, same factorization, now I factor beta out, but beta with beta goes to one, and I get the spatial orbital integral, and it's parenthesis 1h1. And now that I've realized because the spatial part's the same in helium atom or something, uh, this guy is the same as that guy, and so therefore this integral is the same as that integral. So I can lump those together. I could add those together. I get it twice. I get it once for alpha and one for beta. So the total sum result is two times this guy. How about the two electron integral? 
Well, the two electron integral we already argued. The uh, the beta part comes out here from the first two indices, then the next two indices are alphas. The beta times beta goes to one, alpha times alpha goes to one. And I get this spatial orbital integral here. Okay, and again, I'm not putting bars on inside here like I did a second ago, because I'm now kind of recognizing that if it's helium, um, whether you're 1s alpha or 1s beta, the 1s part's the same uh, here, 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 and here. So I'm dropping bars from here because now I'm in spatial orbital notation. So if your spin orbitals come in pairs where they have one's alpha and one's beta, like that, but they're in the same spatial orbital, then when you've done the spin integration, um, that spatial part's the same, and then I don't need to keep bars uh, on my spatial orbital integral notation when I've got these parentheses, uh, because now at that point it's become irrelevant. Okay, so just to recap what I just did, um, this term is the same as that term because they both survive spin integration, and they both give me a parenthesis 1h1, and so I add this one plus that one and get two of them. And then this guy, I don't need to keep any bars here anymore because uh, the spatial orbital is the same whether I have alpha or beta. This part is exactly the same. Okay, if I pair up my alpha and beta to be in the same spatial orbital, which is normally what chemists would do if all the electrons are paired. This idea, which I hope you like, has a name. It's called restricted Hartree-Fock. And all restricted Hartree-Fock means is that um, if I have my spin orbitals, they always come in alpha-beta pairs, and they're paired up in the same exact spatial orbital, every pair is. So if I have uh, chi-n and chi-n bar, then these decode into just phi-n times alpha or phi-n times beta, where again, phi-n is precisely the same. And hopefully... You liked that for helium and you would like it in general. If you have a closed shell molecule, meaning all the electrons are paired, there's really very rarely a reason why you wouldn't want to make your spin orbitals obey this uh, feature of having a shared common same exact spatial part. Now the reason I stress that is occasionally people don't do this. It's, let me mention that for a second. What if I didn't have all my electrons paired? What if I had like lithium atom, where I have two of my electrons are paired, that's fine, so that maybe I've got an alpha and a beta in the 1s, but then I put one electron in the 2s, and let's pick it as being alpha, then not all the electrons are paired. Well, what am I going to do? Um, a lot of chemists would say, well, fine, um, this guy's not paired with anybody, but still, um, this alpha and this beta are still in the same spatial orbital. It's still a 1s orbital, so the spatial part's the same, and then a lot of the things we just discussed, you know, will still hold. However, some quantum chemists will say, well, you know what? Because uh, there are more alphas than betas, then um, this alpha electron will interact a little differently than with the rest of the system than this one. Why? Well, we just argue that these exchange integrals will go away uh, if you have two electrons that have um, opposite spins, but if you have two electrons with the same spin, then you'll have an exchange term. So this electron, if you like, feels an exchange term due to this one, but this one does not. And so then you might think, well, gee, those two electrons don't feel the same experience. And so maybe I should allow this alpha electron to be in a slightly different orbital than this one. Now this probably sounds very uh, weird to you if you're a chemist, but mathematically, you could do that. You could say, all right, I allow this, or this electron with the alpha spin to be in a slightly different spatial orbital than that one. And mathematically, you can totally do that. There's nothing wrong with it mathematically. And it turns out if you do this, you will get a slightly lower energy in your Hartree-Fock calculation because you've given a little extra mathematical flexibility to the system. 
And this procedure is called unrestricted heart refoc. It means you have no longer restricted this alpha beta pair to have to have the same spatial orbital. So it's a mathematical trick. Um, maybe sounds weird from a physical basis if you're used to a lot of chemistry, but uh, can be done on a computer and uh, has the advantage that it can give you a little bit lower energy and the variational method is all about getting lower and lower energies. So that is a thing sometimes people do. Um, and uh, if you do, then um, I need to be careful because now my beta spin, spin orbitals, do not necessarily live in the same spatial function as the alphas. And now I must keep a bar on this one because this phi n bar may not be the same as this phi n. That's the point. So we need to know when we're doing Hartree-Fock and doing some of these derivations, am I in a situation where I've got restricted orbitals? If so, I can do all the simplifications we talked about previously, or not. Am I doing unrestricted orbitals, in which case I need to keep some bar indices even when I'm in my spatial orbital integral notation with the princess, because maybe this orbital isn't the same as that one anymore. If you do this UHF trick, you will get a lower energy uh, in general, but um, at least for open shell systems anyway, um, but it introduces something called spin contamination. It basically means uh, if I had, say, a singlet state that I wanted to study, it would be uh, mixed in with some triplet states. Or, or uh, a doublet state might be mixed in with some quartet states. And uh, from a sort of a mathematical niceness point of view, you might think, mm, that's somehow not uh, something I would want. Or you have the wrong spin symmetry uh, for your solution. Uh, so there are pros and cons to this UHF approach. Um, sometimes the UHF approach can be easier to converge if you have open shell systems, systems that have unpaired electrons. In general, UHF is easier to converge than RHF. If you had restricted orbitals for an open shell system, sometimes people call that ROHF, restricted open shell hard tree fun. Uh, and sometimes ROHF is very hard to converge uh, when you're doing a calculation, and UHF can be easier. So that's a practical reason why you might do this uh, thing of allowing the spatial orbitals to be a little different. Okay, now let's zoom back out and uh, talk about some easier stuff. Uh, so let me write again the Hartree-Fock energy expression and show you that it's super easy to use this to jot down quickly the energy of a molecule or an atom in terms of its one and two electron integrals. We've just argued that this term, because it's a diagonal term in the same spin orbital on the left and the right, always survives spin integration. We've talked about how the left indices are the same here and the right indices are the same here, so it always survives spin integration. And this one we said, well, it's a toss-up, it depends, do i and j have the same spin or not? That'll tell you if it survives or not. I can go from this down to a quick set of rules of thumb to say if I have any atom or molecule I can jot down what's its energy in terms of these quantities or shorthand notation for these quantities. This guy, because it always survives and I get one for each electron, each electron always contributes a term, parenthesis, because I got rid of the spin already, so the spatial orbital integral, parenthesis IHI, which is equal to HII. I'm gonna keep introducing even simpler and simpler and simpler notation from here on out. So this guy decodes into HII, that's easy to write down. Some people just say HI because it's the same index I with I. This guy, each unique pair of electrons, contributes a term here that survives, and I'm gonna make a even more shorthand for this, so I'm gonna go from here to spatial orbital integral notation, IIJJ, and then that, because it comes up so often in Hartree-Fock, I'm going to say, you know what, instead of writing this, I'm going to write JIJ. So J is going to stand for Coulomb interaction between uh, two electrons in spin orbitals, I and J. And the spin part already got factored out, actually. And this one I'm going to call K. K is going to stand for exchange for some reason. Um, it's got a minus sign, so there's a minus sign. Parenthesis because the spin parts already went to either ones or zeros. 
if I have the same spin in I and J, then it survives and I get the spin part being one and I just get the parenthesis integral. And if the spin parts were different, then that went to zero and I'm not even gonna count him. So here for this guy, I'm gonna only count unique pairs of electrons that also have the same spin. And each one of those that there is gives me a term minus Kij. And these three rules are very easy to memorize. Go ahead and memorize those. And uh, I can write this down just like really, really fast for any atom or molecule, as long as there aren't too many electrons. Otherwise, it would get tedious. So let's do an example. Let's look at lithium atom. Three electrons. Here they are. Uh, one, two, three. And you can number them in different ways, but let me use this numbering scheme for right now. Let's call the 1s alpha one spin orbital one, the 1s beta one spin orbital one bar, and the 2s alpha one spin orbital two. Okay, so I'll call them one, one bar two. And what is the UHF energy for this? So let's for now assume I allow the spatial orbitals maybe to have different functions to them if they're alpha versus beta, mainly thinking about these two. Suppose that I allowed these to be in different spatial orbitals. Well, then I need to keep bars on things. So if I know I'm talking about this guy's spatial orbital or that guy's spatial orbital, but let me use these rules I had a minute ago. Each electron contributes an H term. So here's one electron, he contributes an H term, H11. Here's an electron, he contributes an H term, H1 bar, one bar. They may not be the same if I have unrestricted orbitals. This guy contributes an H, H22. Each pair of electrons, unique pair, gives me a J term. What are the pairs? Well, one with one bar, so there's J1 bar one. Uh, one with two, here's J21. One bar with two, here's J21 bar. Each pair of electrons with the same spin gives me a minus K term. I only have one pair like that. This two with one guy, so he's minus K12. Done. Um, how would this simplify if I said, you know what, I'm gonna want restricted orbitals. So these two guys live in the same spatial orbital. Then you just erase the one bar, um, the, the bars on everything. So H1 bar one bar becomes H11, and I can add it with this one, and I get two of those guys. H22 doesn't care. This guy becomes J11. This guy is J21. This guy becomes J21, so I can add those two, and I get that. And then this guy was unaffected. So it's kind of a piece of cake to write this stuff down or then simplify it into this. Oh, I can see my cats are interested in what I'm doing. Let me let them in. Hey, kitties. Fuck. Oh, they're checking it out. They're seeing what I'm up to. From this, I can see that it's really easy um, to understand Hun's rules. Hun's rules are given to you kind of this, this mysterious rule, and you're like, where does this come from? It's super easy to see how this comes from uh, the pseudo-classical interpretation of the Hartree-Fock energies. So what was Hun's rule again? That's the one where it says, if I've got two different ways to pair electrons or put electrons in orbitals, um, I'm gonna prefer the way that keeps them unpaired if I'm putting them in equal energy orbitals versus one where I pair them up. So don't pair up the electrons till you need to is kind of a shorthand way of saying one of the Hun's rules. Uh, another way of saying it is high spin states tend to be more stable than low spin states for a given uh, electron configuration. So just think about P2 uh, electron configuration or something really, really simple. So like carbon atom fills the 1s, fills the 2s, then you've got two more electrons to put in the 2p. And how do you do it? Well, this is how you do it. You put uh, one electron in one of the p orbitals and another electron in another p orbital. What you don't do is this guy. You don't pair them up. Uh, why? Because Hun says don't do that. Keep them unpaired to keep the high spin configuration before the low spin one. Why does Hun say this? Well, let's write down the Hartree-Fock energy for these two electron configurations. Each electron gives an H term. Each unique pair of electrons gives a J term. And each unique pair of electrons with the same spin gives a minus K term. So here we go. Here, I get H11, H22, J12, minus K12, all right? What about this guy? Similar, but not the same. I get 
here they're both in, we'll assume um, we're doing restricted Hartree Fock for a second. So then I can add this one and this one to get two H11s. I get a J11. I don't get a minus K. Why? Well, but they have the same spin, uh, or the opposite spins. And since they have opposite spins, there's no K term. So which energy is lower? Well, um, because these are p orbitals that are like px or py or whatever, you would expect this h11 to basically be the same as that h22, and that's going to match this term. So the one electron terms are the same on the left and the right. doesn't matter. This j12 is the Coulomb repulsion between like a px and a py orbital. That might not be the same as this Coulomb repulsion, because now you've got an alpha and beta in the same p orbital. So there's a little difference there. It's hard to guess you know, which one's bigger or smaller. We'd have to wave our hands about that for a second. But uh, this one definitely has a stabilizing K term. These K integrals and J integrals are either zero or positive numbers. Uh, so the fact that this is minus means this is stabilizing. It drives the energy down. This guy doesn't have that minus K term. And as long as that K term isn't negligibly small, we would expect that the configuration on the left is going to have a lower energy, and it typically does, and that's where the Huns rule comes from. Cool. Okay, so the energy is lower because I subtract an exchange integral, and that K12 is a positive number that I subtract.